Um, so thanks. As mentioned, um, I'm Stephen Stewart. I'm from Google. Um, I want to. I'm not going to talk about Go. <laughs> so, um, but I'm really happy that it was talked about. Um, I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about gRPC. Um, but what I want to talk about is is enterprise SDN and a project called Faucet. Um, and I'll start by talking about what is enterprise SDN. Um, so um, I've been at Google for a while. Um, my first decade, I worked in production networks and did data center stuff. Um, and there, the problem was mainly east-west traffic, very dense, highly regular topologies, um, in particular in very well-engineered spaces. Um, the feeds and speeds now are 40 gig and up. Um, you know, back when I was doing this, you know, 10 gig was a big deal. Um, I put VM migration there because when I talk about the enterprise problem space, and wireless um, data center people now always want to tell me that um, that VM migration is similar to the wireless problem. Um, enterprise, in contrast, is mainly about north-south traffic. Um, it's about irregular and hierarchical topologies. Um, I find the most interesting part of this is the reachability domains and authentication and access control space. Um, you know, we have guest networks, and we have to ensure that there is no touching between the guest networks and the authenticated networks where, um, where we do kind of the company business. Um, we also like the guests on our wireless network to not attack each other. Um, feeds and speeds tend to be 10 gig and down. Um, and by down, I mean like all the way down to 10 meg, half dupe, that badge reader in the closet that no one remembers when it was bought or who it was bought from. But if it doesn't work, then no one gets in the building. Um, Wireless is there a bunch of times to reinforce that um, wireless is a big part of enterprise networking. And um, in contrast to VM migration, um, I've never met a VM that migrated somewhere where it wasn't told to migrate. Uh, wireless con clients, in contrast, show up here, then they disappear and show up there. Um, they conduct random attacks. Um, they have you know, problems interacting with chipsets and different um, access point vendors, so on and so forth. Um, so it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite the interesting space. <laughs> uh, so why enterprise? Um, we actually started out um, about six years ago, so more than six years ago, doing work in the WAN internet space um, with a thing called Project W. Uh, and that grew into uh, projects like Van der Vecken and Cardigan, um, Frontline Assembly and Treehouse. Um, they're, they're all capitalized. Um, because of a gentleman named Josh Bailey, um, and you can ask him <clears throat> what that's all about. Um, we had some success here, but our challenge was that because we, we tried to make things that looked like they could go into a regular IETF protocols network or IEEE protocols network that had SDN under the hood, the problem space was conflated with, well, you can't do millions of updates per second, so you can't be an internet core router. It's, well, I didn't want to be an internet core router. I wanted to demonstrate that I could speak IETF protocols and have SDN under the hood. Um, when we moved to the enterprise space, we found it was easier to build a feature complete drop in replacement, a, a feature complete enterprise network. Um, and the thing that we really wanted to explore was the impact of automation in the space in alignment with DevOps philosophy. In Google, we call this SRE. Um, in you know, kind of outside, it's, it's called DevOps, but I, I mean the same thing when I talk about them that way. Um, I'll note that this was a big turning point for us. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to invoke the invention of plastic. Because when plastic first came out, um, not that I remember this personally, but um, when plastic first came out, people used plastic to make fake wood. That's kind of what we were doing in, in replicating things that would appear in an ITF protocols network. Um, you know, we, we were, it was like using plastic to make fake wood. When we shifted over to the enterprise space, we actually said from, a ground, from the ground up, how do we leverage SDN in this space and build a solution that plays to SDN's strengths? All right, how do we make something out of real plastic? So our objective then was more thoughtful, predictable management of flows. Right? We wanted to actually understand what happens in an enterprise network and how do we use principles of software-defined networking to control things, to implement things like, um, uh, like uh, reachability domains and access control. Um, we wanted less heroic intervention. 
I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but this notion of how does DevOps apply to networking, right? We want velocity of feature development and bug fixes, right? We want to uh, we want to automate the process of hardware qualification, uh, both for testing a new switch, right, new hardware when we get it. We want to know that we can program it to do the things that we want to do. When we get a firmware update from a vendor, we want to know that we can still program that switch to do the things that we want to do, um, that it hasn't regressed in some way. Um, and we want to automate the process of testing Canary and rollout, <clears throat> meaning when we test when we do testing, we want to know that the product of that testing is useful to indicate whether the system will work in the, in the wild. Uh, this is a concept called push on green. Um, there's a whole paper on it, as it turns out, um, that the idea is um, when you can make, it, make and test a release and push it out to production faster, you overcome your resistance to, to doing so. Right, you get into a cadence of, if I'm going to release every two weeks, I know I'm going to release every two weeks. Right? I start to develop practices around releasing every two weeks. Um, I will take the liberty of characterizing a lot of, of the, the networking space as releases aren't something that happen very often. Right? You, you, know, you get a new firmware release from a vendor, and you subject it to nine months of qualification, making sure that it isn't going to break when you actually deploy it in the real world network. When you do, you're still you know, in for a you know, nail-biting, you know, you know, table-holding time, <laughs> wondering if it will actually work, right? because your, your lab qualification won't necessarily test all of the corner conditions that might exist in a production network. Um, so we want to address that with uh, these principles of push on green, continuously testing and releasing software. And we want our tests to be a true indicator of whether the system will work in production or not. Um, for us, this means that vendor engagement starts with pushing our tests to them, saying, you know, if you want to be a device in our network, here's the, you know, the, the way that you get to come and have a talk with us about what your device does is you pass our integration tests. There's a GitHub repo. You, you know, clone that, make, make test. When you have done that, then I'm all about having the conversation about how many flows and what tables and how many tables and matches and actions and all that. But in order to even get to the point of having that conversation, we have to know that we can program your device. And the way that we know that we can program your device is you pass the integration tests. Um, I want to also talk a little bit about error budget here. Uh, so who's read the SRE book? Who even, who even knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> um, there's a book called Site Reliability Engineering. Um, it's written by a bunch of folks at Google. Um, and I highly recommend it for the first couple of chapters because it talks about this notion of error budget. Right? Error budget is what's left over after you have delivered the SLO that you want to provide. Right? So for example, um, four nines gives you 56 minutes of error budget per year. If you delivered four nines of uptime, you get 56 minutes to play with. And when you realize that, you are empowered, I argue you're empowered, to do things in those 56 minutes like upgrade the system, right? You are encouraged to reduce outages and reduce the downtime associated with upgrades because if, obviously if you use up all of your error budget with, um, with outages, you don't have time left for upgrades. If your upgrades take a long time, then suffering an outage is going to throw you out of spec. And I'll set aside for the moment the game that some folks play that upgrades don't count against that error budget. We think that they do. Um, and we very much have this philosophy of we can only consume that error budget, right? And we'd prefer to send, a, we would prefer to use it on upgrades rather than outages. So how do we do this? I, so I'm sorry, I'm obliged to shake my fist in the air when I say cyber RFP um, because um, actually I, I hate the name, but um, it's, the, it's the name that was chosen for the process of the way that we ask for features is we program OVS to be the switch that we want to have. We, we populate it with tables, we set up pipelines, we set up matches and actions in OVS, and we write integration tests that prove that OVS was programmed the way that we, that we did it. 
you know, we create you know, we create VMs, we attach them to ports um, on the switch. We send packets that demonstrate both that the programming works to forward the packets that we do want and doesn't forward the packets that we don't want. Uh, and then we publish that as, as integration tests. We do not make lists of RFCs. RFCs are, you know, they're nice. I, I co-authored one. I recommend it highly if you have the patience for it. Mine took eight years, I think. Um, BGP monitoring protocol, if you're inclined. Um, but they are open to interpretation. Even, you know, if you, two people could have a conversation about supporting the RFC and build systems that do not interoperate with each other. Um, we instead write software. We publish that software. If you want to know if your switch works against our software, you pull the software. You run the test. Right? When it works against OVS, which it always does, thank you, <laughs> um, and it doesn't work on your switch, you have some work to do to make it work. Right? Um, so it's, it's very easy and deterministic to tell where the fault lies. Um, OpenFall 1.3 and multi-table is key to this. Right? That's how we, we create tables. Those tables are linked to each other through, you know, go, through go-tos as an action. Right? They're matches and actions. Um, and um, this is how we automate the process of both reporting bugs and requesting features. On the reporting bug side, right, you know, very often uh, the, uh, you know, when you report a bug, there's this long back and forth. Well, what did you do to trigger the bug? What, you know, send me show tech output, which is you know, megabytes of, of text. Uh, from every device that was somehow possibly involved in this, in, in what you experienced. Um, we write a failing unit test to incorporate into the integration tests, and we submit that to the repo to report the problem. And we then tell the vendor, please do a git pull, and there's a new test that you will fail. Please fix. And not much conversation is required except for then you know, days or weeks later, thank you for the new firmware that passes the unit tests. And this is, this is actual, actual experience that we've had in the field. Uh, so what is feature complete in an enterprise network stack? Well, there's the core functionality of packet forwarding. Um, there's also not packet forwarding, or sorry, sorry packet not forwarding. All right? you know, we need ACLs, we need broadcast control. Um, you know, in the form of things like VLANs, right? VLANs are a form of, of broadcast control. Um, we need a suite of integrated NFEs, right? Because in, in a fully functioning um, enterprise networking stack, you need some policy switch routing. There might be some stuff that you want to do with BGP um, to set access policy. Um, enterprise IT managers love port mirroring, just saying. Um, you need to do things like LDP for phones. Um, some phones require a very specific LDP packet uh, to find their SIP server or, or know what VLAN that they need to operate on. Um, you also need some other, you know, things that are more host-based um, in the form of, you know, you want to do 802.1x authentication. Well, it turns out there's a thing called host APD that's very nice. Um, we like it a lot. Um, and so I don't feel any need to make my own 802.1x authentication engine because there's one that comes with Linux, right? There are things that come with Linux that do NAT and DHCP and DNS um, and, and all those things um, that make it, again, very easy to test. Right? These are, in fact, well-tested solutions um, to incorporate into a whole stack. Um, the other advantage of this is we bring a lot of these NFEs onto hosts where they can be very quickly restarted um, individually as opposed to having to reflash and reboot a, you know, a um, you know, a switch with sheet metal wrapped around some ASICs. Um, you know, in, you know, more and more, you know, the switch ASICs are really fast, but that little mobile Pentium processor, I know they're a little better than that these days, but um, that's, you know, that was chosen in order to not contribute too much to the heat budget or not contribute too much to the, um, you know, to the dollar price of the switch. It wasn't chosen to reboot fast in seconds, for example. Uh, and this gets back to the SLO and error budget. Um, conversation, right? You know, we want to make components of, the, components of the system either restart very quickly or never need to restart at all, right? Um, 
why is multi-team? So this is where I find out where the operators are in the room. Who has ever um, optimized an ACL in order to not use up all the TCAM on a line card that you can't afford to forklift? Nobody. <laughs> so that's a thing, right? When, uh, you know, in, when in TCAM land, you know, you want to take, you know, you want to express ACLs, you have to mash everything into one table, right? And so you, you wind up, um, you, know, you know, doing this, um, you know, combinatorial expansion of every possible option um, when you can actually break it apart into multiple tables and have matches in one of the action be go to another table. Um, things are much more clear, right? You can just articulate what the pipeline is going to be um, and, and watch packets go through that. Um, so, I don't know, I think on a previous slide I said something bad about, TG, about TGP, and I guess I'm, now I'm going to explain myself. Um, so, table type patterns were added to OpenFlow after 1.3. And fundamentally, they are a means for the ASIC to express how special it is in some way. Um, and I really don't want to know. Um, I'm sure it's very nice. I'm very happy, personally, that a lot of thought goes into making ASICs that perform well, that have special features for accelerating IPv4 forwarding, or you know, doing you know, great things at, the, you know, at, at L2. But I want that to be below an API, where below that API, someone else makes smart decisions about taking the pipeline that I want and mapping it to the hardware underneath. I don't want to have to absorb that complexity above the API. And so TTP, unfortunately, is a way to cause that to happen. And so I'm not really in favor of it. Um, our preferred solution is that the OFA deliver this standard API um, and that OFAs then map that to understanding, you know, an understanding of what the hardware underneath does. Right? As a result, Faucet runs on switches that have Broadcom ASICs, custom ASICs, NPUs. I think there's some FPGAs. And we don't know about any of it, because we define the standard by specifying how OBS is programmed. Again, can't thank you enough for that. <laughs> um, and then once the integration test passed, then I want to know some things about how special the hardware is, because how many tables can I put in, and how many flows are there in a table. Um, but I want that all to be properties below the API, not, um, not, things, that I, not things that I have to program and um, absorb that complexity above the API. Um, so this is where people say to me, but you could have a better API. Um, and I could. Um, and here I'm going to briefly retell a story that was told better by Luis Andre Barroso um, about x86, uh, because you know, we, were, we were talking about Spark earlier. Um, and once upon a time, there were all these APIs for processors. Right? There was the x86. There was. You know, I personally have MIPS and Alpha tire marks down my back. Um, there's Titanium, there's Spark. Sorry, I should probably add it to the list. <laughs> um, but um, what happened was, like, I sat next to the compiler team at Digital Equipment Corporation, and they had whole back-end teams for every processor architecture because they had to innovate sideways to generate the best code on x86, which is different from how you generate the best code on MIPS, which is different from how you generate the best code on BAX, which is different from how you generate the best code on alpha. Um, and a funny thing happened. Once we all decided to hold our nose and agree that x86 was going to be OK, um, the world changed. Right Now we focused on improvements below the API that got me these multi-core monster CPUs with gigabits or you know, gigahertz of, of uh, um, cycles per chip, and they're all x86. Yep, OK. <laughs> um, but you know, do I want a better API? Sure, but I have a binary from 2005 that works because I didn't link it with shared libraries. Um, and I've lost, you know, like that badge reader in the closet, I've lost the source, but the thing still does what I want it to do because that API has remained relatively consistent. Uh, so for me, OpenFlow 1.3 multi-table is sufficient. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna talk about API improvements, I'm actually all ears, right? But I'd, I'd prefer to have a conversation about something like P4. Uh, so this is a brief timeline of, of our activities. Um, you know, like I said, this started with Project W, um, which I actually talked about at ONS in 2011, um, a little over six years ago. 
Um, and like I said, we did some things with uh, fake wood, if you will. Um, you can see in, in 2015 or so, we, we flipped over to Enterprise and started building these systems. And uh, uh, we recently just had FaucetCon, uh, which is a, a conference devoted to that Enterprise software stack uh, called Faucet. Uh, and do I have more time? Yeah, we, ha we have a little more time. Uh, you know, if, if if, if you're open for it, there, there was sort of a, a bottom part of your slide there where you talked about an internal project. Are you willing Can to I talk that about there? that at all? Oh, goodness, yeah. Um, I suppose um, I might have a slide or two. Um, so um, as noted, um, we actually have this internal thing that we do um, because we would like to bring the value of SDN networking to the way that we run our office networks at Google. Um, you know, the thing when I go sit at my desk at a, at a desk that has a wired workstation or when I open this thing up um, on campus and associate with our authenticated um, SSIDs. Um, and so, you know, we want to leverage, leverage the value of Fawcett in this by, you know, reducing our development cost, right? And the, the way that we do that is we have this standard OFA that we can write our software stack once and then have a variety of switches on which that software stack can operate. Um, and this cyber RFP process, sorry, shake my hand in the air, um, reduces maintenance cost, right? It's my, the, the time that I have to devote, the labor that I have to expend to qualify a device, to qualify a new, a new firmware release goes way down with these technology and process improvements. Um, now, what's different from Fawcett is we're actually much more aggressive about security. Um, we have much tighter integration of NFEs um, and a much deeper architectural shift toward these SRE principles of running an application reliably. Um, when, when I want to run an application reliably, I go to the actual SRE team and say, here's my problem. Here are the components. How do I structure them to leverage Google's resources around making an application run reliably? Um, so I, I, I think I missed uh, back in the first half of the talk. Um, Fawcett is 8K lines of code, excluding tests. Um, and you know, that's we, you know, that is you know, our expression of how we live the SDN dream of doing things in fewer lines of code. Um, here we have a complete implementation of Google's enterprise networking stack, right? The things that we need in, out of an enterprise network, um, including monitoring and alerting, we can do in 30K lines of code. <clears throat> That's Python. Sorry, it's not Go. Um, it would probably be fewer lines of Go, but um, for the moment, it's Python. Um, fun fact, I actually have readability in Perl at Google. I think I'm one of three people, um, and I should probably walk around with a sack on my head um, for, for having now admitted that. Um, but uh, the way that we do this is there are some new rules for how networking works. Um, so there are rules, right? We all, we all know that there are rules, right? We all know that if, a, um, if an Ethernet frame has the all ones destination address, it must be sent to everyone. Um, and, um, and this is just a rule, right? It's, it's a thing that we all know must be true. Um, now, as it happens, this enables things like rogue DHCP servers, um, because a rogue DHCP, ver, DHCP server can sit there and know that someone wanted, you know, someone issued a request. Um, and it can be there to provide the fake answer before the real DHCP server comes along. Um, and so um, if you're an enterprise IT manager, so this is, this is where I'm going to talk about heroic intervention. If you're, a, if you're an enterprise IT manager, you go to your vendor and say, this is a huge problem. I have this, this rule that everyone knows always has to happen, but I need this to not happen. This broadcast packet, this DHCP request, I need to not go to anywhere but the place that I want it to go. And so please do that. Um, the vendor then says, that sounds like a feature request, and I would like to know how much revenue I'm going to get over the next five years in order to, to implement that feature request for you. Um, the enterprise IT manager then says, no, no, that's a bug. I really need you to fix this in the context of the service contract for which I already pay you money to fix bugs. Um, and you argue about that for, let's say, a month. Uh, and in the end, the vendor says, okay, it's a bug. Tell us more about the bug. Send me the long show tech output, um, and we'll get to work on it. Nine months later, you get a software release that has the 
I don't know what they call it in um, CLI, but you know, some it's you know, DHCP guard or um, you know DHCP server, um, you know, stop hacking my network, um, sort of thing. And uh, and then life is good because heroic intervention works. Um, then the IT manager discovers that that same rule enables anyone to come and be a rogue IPv6 server, right? Anyone can emit IPv6 RAs. Um, and so once again, we go ask for heroic intervention. No, no, this packet, this one has to stop. I know multicast has to go everywhere, but this one has to stop. And you have the same conversation, right? Well, um, it turns out that when you look at the network as a system and not just a bunch of boxes that you have to randomly um, you know, put together and configure and then accept that they're, they're going to do what they're going to do, um, that these rules are not, in fact, rules. We all think that broadcast is necessary, and in fact, it's not. The next question is always, well, how does ARP work? Um, and um, the, the, the rule that whoever has the address that is the subject of the ARP request has to be the one to answer is not true. Um, you know, there's a rule that intra VLAN packets cannot be controlled by layer three ACLs. That's also not true, right? And I think I talked about the other things enough, right? You know, we can achieve development velocity and solve problems on the order of days or weeks, not months, quarters, years. Um, so what are some of these new rules? Well, no, in, our, in, our, in the system that we use internally, no packet is forward that is not explicitly permitted. Um, we have found broadcast to largely be unnecessary. Um, what little of it we is actually necessary doesn't actually need to go to everyone. It can go to an NFE that figures out what to do. Um, sometimes it might involve another, um, another machine in delivering some service like DHCP. Um, sometimes it doesn't because ARP can be answered by the system and not, um, not necessarily the, uh, the machine that has the address that's being requested. Um, EPAL gives me nightmares, it just does. <laughs> Um, host identity for us is a tuple. It's not just a MAC address. It's a MAC address on a switch on a port. Um, and especially where authentication is concerned, if you change any one of those, you have to re-authenticate. So kind of in one fell swoop, um, we get rid of the problem where someone authenticates on a port and then moves to another port and leaves an authenticated port behind. Um, someone unplugs a host and plugs another host in and spoofs the MAC address. Um, or somebody sticks an unmanaged switch on a port and authenticates the whole port on, you know, for, the, uh, for the benefit of everyone who's connected to the unmanaged switch. Um, the, all packets in the system are passed through ACLs, even intra-VLAN packets. Um, we can then um, decide whether a flow is permitted, even if it's between two hosts in the same VLAN that really only need Ethernet to talk to each other. Um, in this system, you cannot defeat security by introducing either routing errors or missing ACLs because the system just doesn't permit them. The system will not run um, if you feed it an incorrect ACL or if you, if you omit an ACL for a segment. Um, you, can't defeat, you can't defeat the system by introducing routing errors because there's no surface for you to specify. Right? The, the plumbing of the system is all written in software. Um, and um, we can push on green with about a minute of downtime. Uh, we restart the whole system in under a minute. Um, and so we use, less of, like we use less of our error budget to do upgrades. Um, and uh, we also actually use less of the system to recover from uh, failures in, in components like WAN. Um, we have um, WAN link recover, we recover from WAN link errors in a couple of seconds, not waiting for routing protocols to do the I'm sorry, I need 10 seconds between hellos, and I need to wait for three of them to miss, and then I'm going to start to reconverge the network. We don't do that. Um, we know much faster and respond much faster as a system. Um, as noted, how does ARP work? Um, ARP is a great way for the system to ask questions, but as noted, um, the host that knows the answer doesn't have to be the one that answers because the system also knows the answer. The system knows what addresses are on what ports and what MAC addresses are needed uh, to put on the packets to talk to them. Um, and in fact, those answers can be lies. Um, if the system knows how to lie to one host in order to influence its behavior um, and make all the other hosts think that it's OK. Um, VLANs can also be a lie. Um, that you know, we actually don't use VLANs as 
you know, heroic intervention to keep a broadcast domain scoped to a specific set of hosts rather than everyone who's physically connected to the entire topology of the, of the system. Um, there's a, there is no spoon joke in there somewhere for the Matrix fans, but I haven't really found it yet. Um, when are you gonna open source this? Don't know, maybe, uh, ask again later. Um, what a lot of people ask is how can I do this without having my own software engineers? Um, and I have two answers to that. One is that software development is a survival skill for a bunch of network engineers. Um, and it's possible that the management chain doesn't really know that. There's a lot of software development activity in writing scripts to apply changes to network elements or um, you know, store configuration changes in revision control systems. Um, but um, there's a whole lot that you need to know just how to run systems, right? There's a systems administration um, knowledge gap in network engineering that also needs to be, um, also needs to be addressed. Um, back to Fawcett. Um, Fawcett is actually, you know, it's in, in addition to being the vendor qualification stack um, and um, systems integration testing vehicle for me, um, for our internal project, it is actually a functioning enterprise software stack in its own right. Um, it's used at Wakato, um, also known as WAND, the Wakato Advanced Network um, Division, I think. Um, they run a, you know, as of, as of a couple weeks ago, they run a, a network of about 50 seats. They have wireless, um, four access points of wireless that cover about 30 clients. Um, they actually publish all of their workflow automation in GitHub. Um, so the way that you interact with that system is when you wanna make a configuration change, you issue a pull request to GitHub um, and then Ansible playbooks take over and, and do the right thing to restart the controller or apply an ACL. Um, they also publish all of their monitoring um, that you can go find um, if you look for Fawcett STN on the, uh, say, do a Google search, for example. Um, and there's a couple of other examples. Um, the, on our roadmap, um, there's a hole in our strategy around actually dealing with the switch. Um, the switches are programmed with OpenFlow, not configured so much, but still the controller address needs to get configured, right? The, the, um, the address of the control plane network interface needs to get configured. Um, and so this is where, uh, this is where the, this is the gRPC part of the conversation. Um, GNMI, GNOI is, is a layer on top of gRPC that specifies um, how we want to programmatically do those things instead of um, screen scraping commands and SSHing and doing procedural config stuff. Um, and that's also the way that we want to deal with uh, setting PoE and MaxSec on interfaces um, or um, in the context of streaming telemetry, um, rather than using SNMP, um, we'd like to use GNMI streaming telemetry to get information about CPU and memory and what's the temperature of the box and how, you know, how many fans are there and are they all running. Um, we're doing some stuff with wireless, um, specifically around open config that we wanna provision SSIDs and set channels and power um, with open config rather than the proprietary methods of today. Um, and we're doing a little more with NFE packaging based on what we learned internally um, to develop Fawcett as a more complete system with, um, with better NFE packaging and, and shout out to Mininet because we use Mininet for that. Um, P4, um, replacing OpenFlow as a means of interacting with the switch. Um, that the first thing has actually come to pass. Um, there's a vendor that makes a box that has a P4 chip under the hood and they have the, an op OpenFlow 1.3 multi-table OFA um, that translates, um, you know, translates instructions in OpenFlow into things in P4. Um, when our workflow standardization requirements can be met, right, when we can actually publish an integration test suite using P4 runtime to talk to devices directly, um, you know, we're happy to do that. Um, one of our big things is we're not looking for more lines of code, except maybe in tests, you know, because we always like more lines of code to test. Um, and so P4 for us is a vehicle to keep the, keep the hardware independence, but get more expressive power. Uh, this is Pizod. Um, so, uh, Fawcett actually runs on a bunch of hardware, and one of the, one of the bits of hardware that um, it runs on is this. This is a Zodiac. This is a, a four-port um, 
fast Ethernet switch that runs OVS on an Atmel processor. Um, and so it does all of the OpenFlow 1.3 multi-table things. Uh, the ports are all fast Ethernet, but if I tried to push more than about 15 megabits through, probably all the magic blue smoke would come out of the chips and, um, and it would smell bad. Uh, but uh, Fawcett as a, as a controller is published in a Docker image and uh, it runs on both Pi and um, Intel. Um, and it's the same code. Um, Josh is always trying to whittle it down to make it smaller. And so the Docker image right now is 170 megabytes. It runs in 45 meg megabytes of memory. Um, you know, toward the push on green conversation, um, I can do a service restart on this in 20 seconds. Um, and so when I want to refresh my home network, um, I, I pull a new Docker image and I do a service restart. And 20 seconds later, I'm running the new code that has Prometheus support for, um, for scraping metrics, um, or I've got some new you know, layer three forwarding behavior based on BGP. Um, the whole thing will reboot in 120 seconds. Um, there are a lot of very fancy multi-terabyte or multi-terabit switching monsters that can't meet those objectives of restarting the service in 20 seconds or restarting the whole box in um, 120 seconds. Um, so um, you're probably wondering what the connection of this is to a real enterprise network, right? So that's, you know, as advertised, I can take this off and run a real enterprise class switch. Um, and in fact, welcome to my home network, right? So that's an allied Telesis X930 with 48 ports of one gig and four ports of 10 gig. Um, and this is actually the pie, this is that pie in the picture um, that, uh, you know, this isn't, you know, think of it as an SDN controller as a microservice. Um, the, uh, the operators in the room, of which I've, I guess I've already determined that there aren't any, <laughs> um, but uh, the operators in the room will notice that uh, there's a thing missing, which is the serial, serial console connection to the console server for out-of-band access. Um, and so I added that in a later version, um, also with the opaque black data center cover for the Pi. Um, but that's, you know, that, that same stack, um, you know, we also run in, in our lab at Google on Intel machines that test, you know, the various flavors of switch that support faucet um, that come in 48 by 1G, 4 by 10G. We've got some 48 by 10G, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and that is actually the end. Um, so. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for, uh, for opening the kimono a little bit, or, or in your case, the Hawaiian shirt. Yes. Um, if, if we do have questions, uh, uh, please uh, uh, ask them. Yeah, so first of all, uh, this is fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Um, I actually work on the Prometheus team, so I'm super happy to hear that you uh, like Prometheus and you guys are using that. That's great. Um, so if I wanted to get started with Fawcett, like a total, you know, kind of 101, is there like a link you'd recommend or a GitHub repository? Um, this is fascinating and I'd love to learn more. Yes, uh, so the, the GitHub repo is uh, github.com slash faucet SDN slash faucet. Um, it's probably buried in a link in the slides, but you know, again, I'm... Or faucet um, the, uh, uh The community that, that curates it, um, recently set up a foundation. So if you, if you do a Google search for Fawcett Foundation, you'll probably find something as well. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's as easy as git clone, make, make test. Um, or if you're a Docker fan, um, you can pull the Docker image and Thank you. So, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a big fan of the pip install thing. Um, just I, I'm at, at home. I just I pull a Docker image because all the all the all the uh, all the dependencies have been resolved. And uh, as an operator, I want someone else to do that work for me. All right, uh, Bob. I, I share your uh, your sort of dislike of of TTPs. It's always discouraging for me to see uh, OpenFlow to see you know OpenFlow change to become more like the crummy switches rather than the crummy switches becoming more like OpenFlow. So I encourage you you know I, I'm encouraged by uh, both by you providing leverage to move switches in the right direction uh, towards being more orthogonal and also OpenV switches being a, a great sort of example of how to do it right. So thanks. Thank you. And thank all of you for hanging in there until 20 to 5 on a Friday.
All right, uh, let's thank our speaker one more time.